Um, great. Okay, so hi everyone. Today I'll be talking to you about my PhD research, um, which does sound a bit formidable at the beginning, but I promise to break it down. So we're interested in using environmental DNA to identify flower visiting insects for avocado trees in the southwest. That's my whole PhD, uh, and today I'll be talking to you about two of the major topics as part of that. Before I jump into that, however, I would like to acknowledge the Bibbulmun and Pilbulmun people upon whose land we stand and whose land I worked upon. Uh, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. This work was done with Curtin University in conjunction with E.S. Cowan University and is funded by the Southwest Catchment Council as well as Horticultural Innovations. So the first question that naturally comes up when you hear new, new terminology, what is environmental DNA? Well, environmental DNA has one of two sources. It can be either abiotic, non-living, or biotic. We can get DNA from air, soil, or water, and then we can use that DNA to characterise the organisms that live within those substrates. Now, equally, we can also sample organisms that act as intermediate trees. So these may be flower-visiting organisms, parasites, or scavengers. And the way we sample these organisms is that we can collect those organisms to work out what flowers they've been visiting, if it's flower visitors. We can work out what mammals they've been parasitizing from their DNA, if they're something like a mosquito. And if it's something like a, if, so if it's something like a fly species, we can actually collect its gut contents to look at what macrofauna it's been visiting. Now, the benefit of this technology is that two sequences from the same species will come back as one taxonomic unit. But if you have more than one species within your sample, and hopefully for avocado flowers we'll have more than just one species, then we'll be able to actually generate measures of species diversity. So why is the avocado industry interested in using such a whiz-bang technology? Well, there's a few questions that exist within the avocado industry which haven't yet adequ adequately been answered for the southwest of Western Australia. The first is, who are the major pollinators? Avocado trees are native to Central America where they're pollinated by native stingless wasps. Unfortunately, we don't have those species here, and probably not a bad thing given the debacle of cane toads. And so, as a result, there's increasing use of Apis mellifera, the European honeybee. However, as many of you are obviously aware, the European honeybee is a bit temperamental. It's not always interested in the pollen or the nectar resources offered by avocado trees. And as a result, there's been increasing interest in native alternatives. These native insects may include native bees, native wasps, butterflies and moths, but actually how to bring these into your orchard and if they are even effective are all questions that currently don't have adequate answers. The next thing is, is how do these managed and unmanaged insects, native and um, the European honeybee, vary both through the avocado flowering season but also spatially within an orchard? If an orchard is adjacent to bushland, for example, does that, do those trees that are right on the edge get greater pollination as a result of being close to bushland and then as you go closer to the orchard, the effect of that bushland reduces or is there no effect at all? Again, a really important question for how orchards are designed, but th currently there are no answers. The next thing is, is what's the effect of co-flowering resources on successful avocado pollination? If there's weed species in the understory of an avocado orchard or there's adjacent bushland that's flowering at the same time as avocado trees, is this a competitive effect? So it's actually reducing the number of flower visits to avocado trees? Or does flowering from other species that are non-avocado actually enhance the number of visits? Again, I couldn't give you a straight answer at the beginning of this project. So I think with all of these together, we're re really interested in deploying environmental DNA to help classify some of these flower visiting insects and start to get at some of these really big questions for the industry to hopefully provide some recommendations going forward. With that in mind, the whole objectives of this project were one, to classify the primary flower visiting insects, two, to look at the likely pollinator cohort from these flower visiting insects, and three, look at how they vary both spatially and temporally. So the research topics of my whole project. So topic one was to see if we could use environmental DNA to help classify some of these flower visiting insects. The second was to see how these flower visiting insects change over the avocado season. The third was to see if we could also use environmental DNA to see what other flowering and habitat species orchard insects actually rely upon. 
And then the last one was to look at how the diversity of both orchard insects and the plant resources, so flowering species, for example, that they use actually change with adjacent land use. And here we measured orchards that were adjacent to either pasture or bushland, which we deemed the primary land uses adjacent to avocados in the Pemberton region. So for the purposes of time today and the fact that David Cook wants to talk to you at length about flies, I'm only going to be talking to you about two topics. One is topic one uh, and is, the next is topic three. So we'll be talking about can eDNA be used to identify flower visiting insects and then what resources those insects actually use. So let's jump straight into it. So I'm just going to provide you a little bit of an idea about how this method works so that it doesn't seem so esoteric. So the idea is, is that when an insect visits a flower, it should leave trace amounts of DNA. So I've represented those here as little blue dots. We can collect that flower as an individual sample, or in the case of an avocado tree where it has mass blooming inflorescences made up of hundreds of flowers, we can actually collect that whole inflorescence. We can then ground it down in a good old fashioned mortar and pestle to get our sample. And then we can use insect primers, which are just DNA regions that are specific for amplifying up insect DNA from a sample. We can then amplify up our insect DNA, sequence it to get our DNA of interest, and then we compare it to something called NCBI. NCBI is an online library of previously sequenced organisms. And if the sequence that we've generated matches an organism that's in the library, we can achieve species identification to work out which insect visited that flower in the first place. So what was the study designed to first test this technology out in the field? Well, we went to one orchard in 2020 during peak flowering, Marinbrook Farm, operated by Doug at the front here, um, and we were interested in comparing environmental DNA with two conventional methods. We wanted to compare environmental DNA with cameras to monitor flower visits and pan traps which are just bowls filled with soapy water in order to measure the three different communities of insects detected by all three and work out who the most common flower visiting insects were. So we visited eight trees in this orchard and at each tree we used our three methods. So we collected five inflorescences, so there's groups of flowers from the tops of avocado canopies and the bottom. We set up cameras to monitor three hours of flower visits over two days, so six hours total. And we deployed those pan traps, those bowls filled with soapy water uh, in order to capture the broadest community of insects possible. And now the reason quickly that we use different coloured pan traps is because each colour corresponds to maybe a different insect's interest group. So for example, bees have a particular affinity for blue, uh, yellow is more for wasp species, and then white's a bit of a catch-all for anything else that might be interested. And so we we're interested in comparing the flower visiting insect communities and insect diversity generally across these three methods. So what were our key findings from this study? Well, when we look at the key avocado flower visiting insects, for those that remember 2020, it would be no surprise who the winner was. It was hoverflies. These guys visited over 130 times per hour. They were so prolific that when you were in the orchard, you could actually hear the drone of those, uh, the drone of those flies. It sounded like an airport. Now, these guys were detected with environmental DNA collected from the flowers. They were also detected from the cameras and the pan traps. So they really were everywhere. Now, 13 times less was the European honeybee. These guys visited 10 times on average, uh, 10 times per hour on average, but they were also detected with all three methods. Now, after this, no less significant, thankfully for David Cook, otherwise he'd lose his job, was the califorids, the blowflies and the blowflies, uh, the blowflies and the muscids. Now, these guys would visit on average about four times per hour. Um, but interestingly, they weren't detected with environmental DNA at all. They were only detected with cameras and pan traps. And now, like any new technology, I'm going to come out and tell you why it doesn't work. So the thing with environmental DNA, like I mentioned previously, is it's only as good as its library, which is what I mentioned in the beginning, that thing called NCBI. Now, interestingly, a lot of native fly species in Western Australia actually haven't been sequenced before. And so when we compare our sequences to the online database, it doesn't find any. And as a result, this just highlights why you've got to use multiple methods in order to detect flower visiting insects because no method alone will work perfectly. Now, the last most significant flower visitor were moth species. These guys visited only less than once per hour, but interestingly enough, we have the inverse story here. Moths were only detected with environmental DNA. 
The reason for this is that moth species, especially in the southwest, are largely nocturnal, and both cameras and pan traps need light in order to work. And so environmental DNA was actually able to detect those nighttime visits that we often miss when we're doing human observations. And so it was a really interesting um, benefit to see that this technology worked, but the other two methods that are normally used didn't. Now let's just talk about honeybees, because I know a lot of you use those within your orchards, and they're a super interesting um, case study. When we compared the number of detections for the tops of avocado trees, uh, the top of the canopy, so that was above two metres, I should say, as well, and the bottom of canopies, below two metres, we we're interested to see in how many detections we got. And in the tops of canopies, we detected far fewer honeybees than in the bottom. Now, why this is interesting is because Doug has a particularly interesting practice at his orchard, which is that he actually lets wild radish grow wild in the understory of avocado trees. And we think that the presence of understory flowering wild radish actually encourages flower visits by honeybees to the lower parts of avocado trees. So you actually get more, more honeybee visits to the lower parts of the canopy, which is super interesting because it's not showing that competitive effect at all. It's actually showing that by having weed species in an orchard, you can actually encourage more visits to avocado trees. So it's a super interesting early result and one that I'm really looking forward to jumping in more to as I pull together this epic thesis. Um, so jumping into topic three. So can we use environmental DNA to identify these flowering and habitat plants, which the insect communities that live within orchards actually rely upon? So this technology, or this method, is a bit of a riff on the first one that I've shown you. This time, when an insect visits a flower, we presume it's going to be carrying pollen from that species. We can then collect that insect in a pan trap, uh, where it will peacefully drown, and then we can wash that insect to get the pollen, and then we can actually take that pollen water as a sample. Now this time we use plant primers, which are specific DNA regions that amplify up only plant DNA from that sample. We're only interested in the plants here. Um, and then we can amplify up our plant DNA, sequence that, and then once again compare it to that online library. But this time, instead of looking for insects, we're actually interested in the flowering plant species that are on that library to work out which flowering plant species these insects have been visiting. And if they match, then we can find out what flowering species these insects that live within avocado orchards have actually been visiting. So the study design here. So what we were interested in doing is in 2021, we visited three replicate orchards. These orchards were all adjacent to pasture and they all had trees of a similar age, three to five years. What we did is we set up a transect of pan traps set at 1.2 metres high, so they're at about the same canopy height as the avocado trees themselves or where the canopy starts. And we were interested in setting up, again, these blue, white and yellow pan traps in 10 metre intervals along a 50 metre transect in the adjacent pasture, as well as the orchard itself. And we were interested in measuring not only the diversity of insects, but also the diversity of pollen that they carry. Now, in the interests of today, of time, and of not uh, taking away too much time from David Cook so we can talk to you about flies, I'm only going to talk to you today about the pollen results. So what did we find in terms of the plant diversity? So what I'm about to show you is the flowering species that the avocado orchard insects only, we're not even going to talk about pasture, but just orchard insects were interested in. So as you can see, there was a lot. So 63 different species of, is what the orchard insects are actually visiting. So far from being just avocado, there's actually a crazy amount of diversity. So what was really interesting here is that we found that orchard insects were not only visiting the normal species that you would have expected, like obviously avocado, but also white clover, sow thistle, cape weed, and wild radish. But on top of this, and obviously these species are nice and close to the pan traps and they're in the adjacent pasture, but we actually found that insects that live within avocado orchards are willing to travel over a kilometre, which is the average distance away from each of these orchards of native bushland, to visit eucalyptus, bottle brush, acacia and native peas. So what was really interesting here is that even though these insects you know, are no bigger than your thumb, they're willing to travel up to a kilometre away to visit native bushland. And what's really cool about this result is it clearly shows that the presence of native bushland within an agricultural region is actually a harbour of diversity because it's actually encouraging more native insects to both breed up 
grow in diversity, and then visit avocado orchards as well. And so this was a super exciting early result that we found. And as you can see, these are just eight dots of the total 63. So there's so much more I could have talked to you about today, but obviously, you know, we've got to think about David. Um, but there is fantastic diversity that is actually here for these flowering species. And the fact that avocado in insects are interested in so many more species than just avocado is super encouraging as a story for why we need to encourage diversity within orchards. Because really, here we're building ecosystems. And the more species that you have flowering in an avocado orchard, the more species that you have flowering adjacent to an avocado orchard, the more insects you'll be able to encourage, which is ultimately a benefit then for having robustness for pollination in avocado orchards. So what are the key take home messages from what I've told you today? The first one is that avocado trees, far from being reliant on just the European honeybee, rely on an entire community of flies, wasps and moth species. And to encourage these is to benefit the orchard. The next thing is, is that understory weed species, far from being competitive with avocado trees, actually encourage honeybee visits to the lower parts of these trees. And where possible, and I'm aware that not all orchards can encourage honeybees because there's an export market to Japan which doesn't encourage native under, which doesn't encourage weed species, but where possible, weed species should be planted in avocado orchards to encourage um, honeybee uh, visits. The next is that the insects that live within your avocado orchards, far from being reliant on just one species, are actually reliant on a broad community. And therefore, diversity really is the message here today. By planting more species, by having native weed species, whatever there is, you can actually encourage more insect diversity. And then the next thing is, is that clearly native bushland is important. If tiny insects are willing to travel up to a kilometre away to visit native species, then these ecosystems are crucial in order to harbour diversity within agricultural landscapes, which ultimately benefit um, avocado orchards, which is a super exciting result to see. With all that in mind, I'd like to thank you all so much for listening. The last big thank you goes to my volunteers, uh, my 94-year-old granddad, who's actually up the back of the audience today. So, t Terry, can you put your hand up? Just a little. There he is. There's my volunteer. <laughs> big hand for Terry. My 94-year-old granddad, my mum and my friends all got dragged into this and needless to say at the beginning I did not think I would be living amongst the avocado trees but by God it's converted me. So thank you to my volunteers and thank you all so much for listening. I hope you found it a little bit interesting and really curious for your questions. Thanks for a great talk, Josh. Thank you. Um, my questions about the plant primers that you used, yeah. were they 16S primers by any chance? or No, so the plant primers that we used, they were RBCL uh, and TRNL, so they target the Rubocu Rub oh, I, can't, I couldn't even say it off the top of my head, but yeah, RBCL and TRNL, they're conventional plant primers that have been used in other pollen studies. So how confident are you about your sort of taxonomic resolution that you're Absolutely. getting from that? Yeah, 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 it's a really good question. So. Primers, it's a really, it's a good point. Primers don't always hit um, species level. Sometimes they're quite broad and they go up to family level. The benefit of using two primers though is that you get that cross verification. And so we're quite confident with the species that we're able to detect because we use both assays to get down to species level. A very skeptical David Cook. <laughs> I'm like you, Josh, I didn't have to drag my relatives in to help with uh. my research. But um, with your pan traps, mm. did you have uh, like a control where you didn't allow insects in there and you could just see what pollen was moving around yep. airborne? Yep. So it's a really good question. You could absolutely say, oh, how do you know this um, pollen just didn't come from the air and it's just floating around? Now, the thing that I didn't bore you with today was the fact that we also use a thing called a marble trap, and a marble trap is as, as sophisticated as it sounds. It's a cake tin filled with marbles. And what the marble trap did is it effectively captured ambient, air, ambient pollen within the atmosphere. And what we did is that we used that ambient pollen in the atmosphere. We screened it out of the pan traps so that we could confidently say that anything that was found in the pan traps was actually carried by the insects. And so we reduced contamination in that way.
Josh, we have a rows and rows and rows of lavender, mm. hoping to increase um, insects in. Some of it we're due to take out and replace. Are we better to replace that with like your bottle brush, et cetera? Oh, I will always advocate native plant species every time. Native plant species, the benefit of those, it, one, they don't need as much water as lavender, uh, but two, I think the benefit of native plant species is that they have very rich resources of nectar and pollen. And so the thing is, is that insects, like they're good farmers insects, and so they know where the best resources are. And if you're putting native plant species there, nine times out of 10, they'll go there for it. Um, Josh, uh, you mentioned that uh, during the <clears throat> 2020, 2021, there were all the overflies, all yeah. of those, right? Um, did you see a shift in the other years if there were not that many? So some Completely. substitution of that? So Absolutely. So, so I should say that topic two, which we didn't get to go into today, and that's the uh, chapter that I'm still working on at the moment, that chapter is really then exploring that shift in season as well and how the insect communities vary. Um, it's certainly important to note that we've not had a season like 2020 again, where we've had that just absolute proliferation of hoverflies. That really was a golden year and uh, in much the same way that lemmings breed up and then get to crazy huge numbers and then crash, hoverflies seem to follow the same trend and so you have huge years but seemingly they're not as consistent as other pollinators. Um, but for 2020 especially, they were prolific. Um, although I have been detecting them consistently at low numbers since, but I don't think that's to say that we couldn't set conditions that are right to encourage them within orchards. We just clearly need to understand what they are. One preliminary study that I've seen talks about the fact that if we maintain healthy water bodies close to or in orchards, it can actually encourage more hoverflies to breed up there. And so it's going to be a matter of how do you build an ecosystem within an orchard and what do you need to encourage those insects? Josh, um, quick, sorry, to the other speaker. Um, can we touch on number four? Can you just, in a nutshell, yeah, just say the proximity to the bushland um, and pasture paddocks, did that have an effect on the, the, the range of the species in the... So that is still currently being analysed, unfortunately. So I, I, wish, I wish I could give you the best bits of that. Um, but I, I'm still amalgamating. There's a lot of data there. Um, and so I'll have to give you a declan and say I don't know. But um, I think that... Ultimately, I'm really, I'm really excited to see those results because I think that there will be some significant findings there. But unfortunately, today, in what time I had, I couldn't bring it all together. Uh, Josh, great talk. Um, Thank you. Um, there's a lot of available uh, synthetically produced pheromones like beekeeper and that. What are your thoughts? And you know, are there products out there that we can chemically use synthetically to, to spray on our trees to attract more and more? insect pests, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, look, it's a really interesting question. And I would say I saw, like, I saw, an, I saw natural evidence of this for how interesting native and, and European honeybee species were finding pollinizer trees compared to Hass avocados. It seems that there's some pheromone or something going on with pollinizer trees that really interests insects, which Hass avocado unfortunately doesn't have. And so I think the use of, you know, synthetic materials that help encourage flower visits would, you know, it, it makes sense as something that we could utilise. Look, I'm always going to advocate a natural option if I can, and so I'm going to say, you know, increasing plant diversity within an orchard is the, is, the, is the way to go. But there seems to be a limitation for Hass avocado trees in terms of they're just not very interesting. And so, you know, whatever can encourage vi insect visits to Hass avocados would be worth doing. And... In that way, you know, obviously you'd have to see the studies to verify this, but, you know, I would be, I would be pro um, using such pheromones if they were proven effective and obviously if they didn't have an effect on fruit quality at the end. An extremely interesting talk, Josh, and it could you. go on for much longer. Um, you focused on European honeybees, but did you find similar variation in spatial distribution of other species within the tree itself? And did you find similar diversity in the plant samples that they visited? 
So it's a really interesting question. So part one of that, um, we did look at fly species, uh, so diptera as a catch-all, so everything, so hoverflies, califorids, because uh, we were interested to see also if they vary between the top and the bottom of the canopy. Uh, they didn't, so fly diversity didn't significantly increase with proximity to uh, flowering at the bottom, uh, so weed species at the bottom of the trees. Um, we didn't have the sample size to look at things like moths um, and butterflies and other species because they just actually weren't that prolific a visitor. So we couldn't see how they varied within a canopy significantly. So we only looked at flies, we only looked at um, honeybees, and honeybees were the ones that did come out significantly, which is super interesting. Um, and remind me of the second part of your question, sorry. It was the plants that they visited, the, the pollen samples that you mm. collected. Oh. So the thing is, is that now this is the unfortunate thing about pan traps, is that pan traps can't give you species specific. So I can only measure the entire community that happens to fall into that pan trap and then work out where that pollen came from. It's a bit of a hodgepodge once it's in there. Um, so I can only talk about the diversity of everything, um, but going forward, studies that target insects specifically to work out what pollen resources that those ones are using are going to be essential to actually answering that question. This is just a preliminary, really. This is a shot in the dark to see if it worked, and it worked spectacularly, which was super encouraging.